Hey everybody, we're back. Um, this time we're going to keep on doing the same thing. Let me just uh, run this again to remind you where we're at. Um, I still have the exact same single node uh, network with just the bias and the weight terms um, and a handful of sample points. Uh, in the previous few videos we talked about the weight space which you see here. Um, I can actually zoom in and you can see that it's actually being skewed a little bit because of the zoom. Okay, so you can see uh, this is where I started over here at negative one four for the weight and bias respectively. Gradient descent follows the steepest gradient uh, downwards but is also proportional to the gradient. So you see how this is very steep here and these arrows are much much longer than the arrows over here which you probably can't see. Let me zoom in here. Uh, you can see they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and that's because this region over here is actually shallow, uh, is very very shallow. Now one of the things that would be nice would be for it to move quickly across this very shallow uh, region right here, right? This is very, very flat. Um, but it won't because this is strict gradient descent and the gradient isn't very large. Um, so this is one of the things that momentum will do for us. Now let me go ahead and close this and turn on momentum like that. Okay, so now I'm plotting both. Let me blow this up. Okay, so if we zoom in here, the red arrows are gradient descent. That's exactly what we were just looking at before. Goes directly down the slope, hangs a sharp left, and moves directly down the slope here, uh, but very, very slowly. Um, the blue arrows are momentum. You can see the first one is basically the same as the first red one. But now this has a little bit of speed built up. And the second one, it's a little hard to see, but the red arrow goes from here to here. Uh, the blue arrow goes from here all the way down to here. So the way momentum works is it treats uh, the gradient as though it's a force pushing on uh, like a ball or something. So you can think of this as dropping a ball on uh, a high part of a hill and it rolls and picks up speed as it goes downhill into the valley. Now you can see, for one thing, if there was a local, let's say this was a local minima in the weight space, uh, this momentum would actually carry me out, hopefully it would carry me, you know, into the dip and out and over it and continue on descending. Uh, it turns out there are no local minima in this guy. There's only one absolute and it's in here somewhere. Um, but let's look at the momentum a little closely. So you can see one thing that's a little bit inefficient actually is that I came in and I found the dip here and I shot right past it. And it, you know, it starts to get a little steeper over here so I slow down kind of quickly. I turn around and come back and I pass this minimum over here and I do the sort of the same thing and it settles down eventually. Um, but Okay, so you might be looking at this and you might say, oh, I'm, I'm wasting a bunch of time because I'm hunting around all over the place. Uh, where you get a big win is in here. Now, remember that the gradient right here has very, very small increments. It actually makes very small steps because it's proportional to the gradient and the gradient is basically zero. Uh, so the steps in here are very, very small because this, the blue line now, uh, is sort of a like a rolling ball that picks up speed even though this is very very slightly downhill it actually accelerates towards the solution okay so let me zoom in to I don't know just a section right here and you can see look how much longer these blue steps are than these single red steps okay um, and in fact let me pull it up I have a counter and there it is. So with gradient descent, it took 690 iterations to get the error that we wanted. By the way, the error that I want, I decided to make it 0 0.25. So basically, it's going to be oops, uh, the first guy to get inside this ellipse right here. Okay, that's 0 0.250 for the error. All right. 
So with pure gradient descent, that takes 690 steps, most of which are actually uh, back here and just going slowly, slowly, slowly towards the uh, minimum. Uh, gradient descent plus momentum takes 84 steps. So that is quite significant. Now remember that this is very, very simple. So you aren't going to see this kind of improvement all the time. But in general, when things get very, very shallow, it'll speed up the process. OK? So let me go ahead and close this. And let's, um, I'm going to pick a different starting position. So let's start. Actually, let me run it and let's look at it and pick a good spot. Um, why don't we do something over here? So let's make the weight 4 and make the bias 4. Okay, just for giggles. Okay, now before I show you that, gradient descent took 3,000 iterations to get there. Gradient descent plus momentum took 300, right? So that's almost a factor of 10 improvement. Let's uh, blow this up and look at it. OK, now you can see the red line. Let's look over here. This is going to be difficult to see. These red arrows, this whole, this entire section off to the right side is very, very shallow. You can see uh, that these contour lines are very, very far apart, which means even though uh, you're you're far away. It doesn't mean that you're in a region that's steeped. Uh, I'm sorry, that's um, that is steep. So basically, with gradient descent, you're going to drop the ball here, and it's just going to creep and creep and creep until it finally gets into a region over here where the lines are close together, and then these steps uh, for gradient descent start to be kind of large. Now you can see here, even uh, I'm looking at the blue line now, with the blue. Uh, I pick up speed even though it's shallow, and I, I do overshoot it, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, so let me follow this, and you can see we're headed in the direction that it's going. By the time I get over here, it's still pretty shallow, but look how much speed I've picked up, right? For each step with momentum, I've traveled this far. That's maybe one, two, three, four, five and a half ish, right? So just in these strides through this shallow region, I'm converging five times faster. Uh, now, the trade-off, of course, is that you're going to get things like this, where uh, gradient descent actually follows the gradient directly. You are going to overshoot these little minima. Uh, so that actually does cost you some iterations. But in the end, it ends up um, being kind of a win, because over here, you picked up so much speed, you're getting a lot done. Now, on the flip side, this is another obvious disadvantage, right? Um, this is what I'm trying to get into, is this circle. Uh, the gradient goes straight down, turns around, and goes straight there. Uh, the momentum blows right past it, but does eventually come back in. Now, it looks like the path it's traveling is much, much longer than this, um, I don't want to say straight, but this red line that is directly down the gradient into this minimum. But remember, in fact, I'm taking such large steps that I actually reduce the number of epics by almost a factor of 10. OK? So the way, well, let me preface this this way. Uh, this momentum that you're looking at here is just the exact same sort of momentum you would think of uh, if you were to simply drop a ball on a hillside. So what this does is it looks at the location that the weight, OK, I'm sorry, the location you're at in the weight space. Let's say it's right here. Uh, at this spot, the gradient probably points, well, it points orthogonal to this line. So it, it sort of points directly along this path. Um, so if you're here, the best you can tell is you need to keep accelerating that direction. There's no way for you to know that you're, in fact, about to go across a minimum and then end up you know, decreasing your speed a bunch before you turn back around and head towards where you need to go. Um, so there are some modifications to the way, uh, sorry, I can't get this thing to look right. Uh, there are some modifications to the way that you can implement the momentum. 
Uh, the way this one is done in blue is exactly like I said. For the point that you're at in the white space, it evaluates the gradient and treats that like a force tugging on the ball, right? So this behaves just like dropping a ball. Um, now there's another kind of momentum which is just a slight tweak to this. So that would be something like this. At the moment, uh, at the epoch that I'm sitting right here, um, I hope you guys can see the cursor, um, the gradient points orthogonal to these contours, so sort of down uh, and to the left. Now, I evaluate the gradient here, treat that as a force. I already have momentum built up traveling this direction. And so I take 90% of my momentum. I think I'm using 90 right now for the momentum factor. And then I add in a little piece of that force. So I'm right here and I'm accelerating and I add those two up and I get this vector and then I move here. Once I'm here, I do it again. The gradient still points downwards and to the left. Um, I still have momentum traveling downwards and to the left, so I actually accelerate more, right? So it should be the case that this arrow is actually longer than this arrow. Now it turns out you can actually do a little bit better. Uh, I believe the guys that did it, yeah, so originally it was Nesterov who devised this algorithm and Sitskiva um, did some uh, just rough calculations with it recently and showed that it is empirically better. Uh, so what is it? Uh, this other way you can do momentum would be to remove at least one or some of the problems that are like this. Where I'm right here and I check the gradient right here and I treat that as the force and I add it onto the momentum and then I take the step. It turns out it's better to take the momentum that I already have take 90% of that as a step and then check the gradient uh, at the destination and look at what it's going to be once I move. Now, in this case, once I move over here, the gradient now points upwards and to the right. And so then you take that first vector plus the new gradient and you make a new vector that actually kind of starts to cut inside the corner, okay? Um, the way Jeffrey Hinton describes it is it's better to correct the mistake once you've made it uh, than to just assume it's going to be okay here and, and go ahead and make the jump. So I also have that implemented and I should be able to turn it on just by flipping a flag. Okay, so uh, first of all, counts. Uh, gradient descent, this took 3007 iterations this time. Gradient descent with regular momentum took 366. Gradient descent with this new modified sort of momentum, originally described by Nesterov and uh, Sutskiva re uh, recently just fiddled with it. Um, you can actually see that it is 10 iterations quicker, which doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but in a really complicated problem, you'll see that it's, it's actually a little bit better. So let's look at what it does in the weight space. Okay, over here, you can see the blue, the green is on top of the blue. The green is the Sitskiva modified momentum. The blue is regular momentum that we were just looking at. And you can see the green one starts to cut inside while the blue one continues on with its momentum and actually goes out farther. Similarly here, they cross paths. The blue goes out farther while the green one cuts inside and this pattern will continue, right? The green cuts inside here, the blue goes out a little farther. Uh, and that's why generally this is actually a little better. So let's look over here when we get near this error. And you can see as soon as I make these first steps across this, uh, I don't know what you would call it, I guess it's like a local minima in this direction, it begins to burn off this speed rapidly and cut inside the regular momentum, which you see out here, and then ends up in the same uh, solution spot. And it does so using 10 less steps, okay? So that's kind of a cool comparison between the two different kinds of momentum, the two different ways to implement it, and you can see it visually here to get some intuition about what it's really doing. So uh, I hope that helps anybody. And um, I think next time we will look at R-prop, which is a completely different way to 
think about doing gradient descent. Okay, later.